again, I'm glad to be here. Um, as we talk about leaders, though, uh, I, 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 I guess as I was, I was thinking about this, um, I was just kind of putting some things together uh, of, of, of how important our job as shepherding, really, other homeschoolers is. And I remember one time, and this is the only time this has ever been asked of me, but I was at a homeschool conference and this girl came up to me. I bet she wasn't 15 years old, but she must have been a serious type of girl because she asked me after I had spoken this the whole weekend at this big conference. And she comes to me and she goes, so what makes you qualified to be a, a leader? And I'm just like, excuse me, <laughs> you know, like what makes you qualified to ask me that question? Uh, you know, and I was a little taken back by it. And, you know, I didn't have nobody had ever asked me that before because I and I didn't have this like little pat answer that I could give her. But I thought, what makes me qualified? It's because I'm a parent, you know, because I've traveled some of this. And 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 I know maybe that's your first question as a leader, uh, even listening. What makes you qualified? You know, it's not like we have it all together because we don't have it all together. It's not like we get some things right because. I rarely think I get anything right. Um, it's just that we've traveled this path. We've seen some of the joy, some of the pitfalls, and we share that with others. And we're taking them along the same path. So here are my, here are my thoughts. So your, my first little point, and I usually don't do points, and I, I'll start counting, and then I'll get off, and we'll switch to letters. I don't know. I don't, I'm not very good at this. Um, but the first thing to maybe that I want to remind you is that your job really, really matters. That what you do as a homeschool leader matters. And I don't know how you got to be a homeschool leader. Um, I know that about 50% of homeschool leaders just showed up and then they were the leaders, uh, you know, or they didn't show up and someone had nominated them to be a leader. So now they are a leader. Um, I, I, I was at one uh, homeschool support group leaders meeting and the mom said, I just got a ride today. <laughs> and so now I'm like a, a head of a section. Uh, so maybe that's where you found yourself. You know, I believe God wants you here for a reason and that your uh, job matters in what you do because things have changed in the homeschool world. You know, it used to be, as we talked yesterday, if you listened, uh, and I think you could, if you didn't listen, you can still go back and listen to those. Um, but, uh, it used to be in the old days, everybody kind of homeschooled for the same reasons. You know, it was like we had this strong conviction that came out of, we didn't want to do it like they're doing it. So now we're doing it like we want to do it, you know, that God would have us do it. Today, it doesn't feel that way. You know, today, there are a lot of people who don't have any convictions, which is okay. You know, I mean, sometimes we, we look down and we think, oh, they just, they just were forced into it because of COVID. Well, some of us got forced into something, and then we gain some convictions along the way. Um, but, you know, uh, but there are a lot of people who don't do it for the reason we do it. They do it, they see homeschooling as an option, you know, that, oh, I couldn't afford Christian school. I'm not going to put them in the public school. Uh, I can't think of any other kind of schools. Boarding school is not an option yet, you know, uh, so we're going to try this. Um, so they need you, you know, to put them to get them somewhere else. Um, you know, there's a high academic standard among homeschoolers that didn't used to be there. You know, we, we have, there's so much pressure that you didn't, wasn't there at all before. It used to be the world put a lot of pressure on us, you know, and they're always looking at us like, well, you know, how can, how can they do what they do? You know, they need to have their kids in a school building. I don't think that's true anymore. You know, now the school looks at us or the world looks at us and thinks, that's not a bad option. Uh, in fact, you know, in 2020, uh, the whole world decided homeschooling was a great option, that everybody could do it. Um, and I think they see the value in it because I think the world sees that sometimes the system out there is broken, doesn't work. Um, but there's a lot of pressure from homeschoolers themselves. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't remember ever as a as a public school kid ever being asked in junior high, what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But now homeschoolers put all that pressure on. And there are groups that are saying, well, you got to learn 
you got to, you know, know Latin word roots and you got to do this and you got to be involved in speech and debate and you got to be, you know, uh, take uh, a dual enrollment and all these things. They they put a lot of pressure on homeschoolers. And I just think uh, uh, they need homeschool. They need you. Uh, and and we didn't have social media. I don't even think know if we had social media the first time I was here. Uh, and now the pressures from that are just so, so huge because everybody seems to want to post the incredible things they learned that day, you know, an incredible lesson they had, an incredible unit study and how they made, you know, this dugout canoe out of a tree in their backyard and, and how it was so awesome and how they're going to go down into the ocean or whatever, you know, and other moms are like, I don't, that's not what we do. I must be a loser of a mother. And uh, they just need you. Um, in fact, really, when I started talking to leaders, it was because of my sister, Wendy. Uh, Wendy was kind of new in homeschooling. She'd only been doing a few years. And she said all her mentors who started kind of drifting away, kind of started drifting away. <laughs> And she had no one to lead her in, or give her direction. And so homeschool leaders, your job is huge, really, really huge. Uh, the second thing is to remember that all homeschoolers are pioneers. Uh, you know, we used to say, or I've heard others say, that uh, the early homeschoolers were the pioneer homeschoolers. <coughs> they were the ones who were threatened with jail and they were the ones who the, you know, the trailblazers and because there was no homeschool convention, there were no homeschool leaders, there were no curriculum, there was nothing. And they are absolutely right. You know, there are, they, they were pioneers, but today I'm thinking the brand new homeschoolers are pioneers as well because they don't, a lot of them will say, I don't even know any homeschoolers. What do I do? You know, my family is against it. It looks pretty rugged out there and I don't know anything. And uh, the stakes feel high, like I'm gonna ruin my kids. And, and, and I think we need to look at them as pioneers as well, um, who desperately need, desperately need a guide um, because, you know, family members are questioning them. And just a side note, uh, you know, and I know there's a lot of pressure on not just homeschoolers, but even the homeschool leaders that as our family looks at us and questions us and, and especially, uh, as a new homeschooler, you know, moms and dads and our parents, grandparents are questioning their kids. Um, you know, the temptation I think is to, uh, have some statistics that show homeschoolers, you know, do just as well or better than private school or public school. And I think the truth is, uh, we should just let our kids do the talking, you know, uh, not, I wouldn't actually let my kids talk, uh, <laughs> but I would, I would let their actions show them that the, that homeschooling works because I can't tell you how many people, uh, who I've talked to older people, maybe who were, they were just introduced to homeschooling or their kids were introduced to homeschooling and they were against the whole thing. And they come around and they say, well, I'm for it now because I've seen a difference between my homeschool grandkids and my non-homeschool grandkids. Um, so that's a little side note. Uh, the third one is remember what it was like. Uh, I think sometimes as, as leaders who have maybe homeschooled for a while, we forget um, and I, when I, I don't know why I think this, but I do, um, have you seen the, the animated movie, the Lion King, you know, where Mufasa, he's this, you know, this, and, and at one time he's trying to get, uh, his son Simba to, uh, to go back and do something important. And I just remember him saying, remember Simba, remember. And I think that needs to, we need to hear that over and over again. Remember what it was like. Because now that my kids are all grown up uh, and even my youngest is 14, I've kind of forgotten. I forget how exhausting it is when you've got little babies uh, in your house or even at a homeschool convention. And you'll see like 
a mom with a little baby on her hip and she's bouncing the thing, you know, trying to look at some curriculum and I'm trying to talk to her, you know, and I forget how hard that is. I forget how tired uh, those moms are. I remember even as a dad with l little kids, I used to long for maybe the word would be lust for uh, a nap on Sunday afternoon. I mean, starting Wednesday, I started thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, when sun, Sunday's coming. And after church, when the kids go down, I can lay down too. Uh, and I mean, I did that for years, decades. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I didn't need a nap anymore. And I didn't feel so tired anymore. And I forgot how exhausting those early days were. So remember what it was like. You know, remember, um, remember how... Uh, all those lies that you once believed. We talked a little bit about them yesterday. But, you know, lies like uh, everyone's house is cleaner than yours and everyone's house is, everyone's kids are smarter than yours or everybody else fix, fixes better meals than you do. In fact, I think we could, we as leaders in remembering, uh, we could help them uh, by the next point is by being real. Just by being real with um those moms you know and by when i say being real what does that mean when i this is like word association when i say the word real and this this is my my big audience is going to answer now uh let me see is there anyone is anyone anyone oh we got an answer here uh when you think of the word real what do you think of authentic <laughs> now change your voice and say another one no i'm kidding uh genuine Anybody, anybody else, anybody else, honest. Here's another one, <laughs> transparent. All right, we're getting the hang of this now. Uh, <laughs> transparent, all those things, right? Uh, it is easy to be open, honest, vulnerable, transparent when everything's going great. You know, when your kids are obedient, your house is clean, you got a good meal cooking, you know, and uh, your kids are walking with God, but it's not so easy to be open, honest, vulnerable, and transparent when your voice is hoarse because you've been yelling at your kids all morning. But that's exactly when we need to be real, but we don't like being real. We've never liked being real. I mean, you think about it, uh, Adam and Eve, at the very beginning, as soon as they blew it, what did they do? They hid and they covered up. Why did they do that? The Bible says they were ashamed. I think they thought this. If people knew what I was really like, maybe they wouldn't like me anymore. I think we've been hiding and covering up ever since that. I mean, you, have you ever been to like, I was going to say the mall, but uh, and here, and here in Maine, do you have malls? Uh, what do you have? What stores? What stores do you have? Someone said uh, they did a trivia thing yesterday, Maine trivia. And I think like they were talking all these, uh, they said this grocery store and it was like or places you would go to shop and they were like Martins. I don't even know what a Martins is, but we'll pretend like you're in a Martins and uh, you see a group of teenage boys. Have you ever noticed how they all look alike? I mean, not like all the boys everywhere, but this one little group, three or four of them, if they all have a hat on, they all have a hat. If they're all wearing boots, of course, I'm just describing everybody in Maine right now. But if you have, you know, camo boots, they all have camo boots. If, you know, if one of them has one, his hat cocked to the side and is wearing certain kind of jeans, they all have the same look. Girls the same way. Teenage girls, if one of them has a hat with a ponytail sticking out of the back, they all have a hat with a ponytail sticking out of the back. If one of them has certain, if they're wearing flip-flops, they all have flip-flops on. I don't think they're doing that because they're acting cool. I think they're hiding. If my friends knew what I was really like on the inside, maybe they wouldn't like me. And so they try to cover it up. I think there's a group that does it worse than, or better, whatever, than teenage boys and girls. Would you like to guess who they are? Homeschooling moms. Because after all, you see those pictures, you see those posts, and you think, wow, that's what a homeschool mom looks like, or a homeschool family looks like. And then you look at your family and you think, wow, I can't let anybody see this. And you know, then you begin to play this I've got it all together game. When you play that game, Nobody wins. In fact, everybody loses and it feels lousy, you know? Uh, and so I'm going to encourage you to be real, you know, to tell someone uh, what's going on. 
uh, especially as homeschool leaders. Because, you know, and I, I think we've been duped into thinking that if people know what we're really like, they won't like that. When the truth is they like it even more, they like us even more. And so uh, moms, I'm gonna just encourage you leaders to be real. In fact, I thought uh, uh, what we should have is every, we should all like get these little placards we wear around our necks that say things like that. Say things like, uh, my son couldn't read till he was 12. You know, I, uh, I hated homeschooling for three years. I hate homeschooling today. Uh, we didn't do science. We didn't do algebra. You know, in fact, uh, all those things that really some of us didn't do or some of us were, but we're so afraid to let anybody know because we think we have to be the homeschool poster child. You know, that if, if we don't make homeschooling look good, then other people might not like it. That's not true. You don't have to be that way. You know, homeschooling is hard, but the dividends are huge and it's worth it. Uh, I remember I was at a homeschool meeting one time and I was talking to the state leaders and we were sitting in the back just talking and and they said yeah we didn't we didn't even do algebra with our kids he said it was just you know we didn't see the need for it our kids weren't we didn't think they'd use it and so we didn't do it and then later then i spoke and i was like yeah even these people in the back they didn't do algebra and they both looked at me i mean in unison and went Shh, you know like don't tell people that and I'm thinking, why not? We need to be telling people that. Because wouldn't it be a travesty if not just them, but our children and all that, they grew up or they homeschooled thinking that we were something that we were not. We need to be real. I think part of that being real is so that others can be real with us. You know, So I'm gonna just help you homeschool leaders and show you how to be, how, how you let others be real with you. Here, and it's so simple. You know, in fact, some, we blow this so many times. I know that like uh, my wife, uh, she was in, a, uh, when I was a pastor, uh, I just started at this church and my wife was in a ladies Bible study. It was this, fir this first gathering of all the ladies while we were there. And they sat in this big circle, they, you know, like it was an informal thing. And, they all went around. It was the beginning of a Bible study. They all went around and said what they would like in a in their time together. And so the first person said, oh, I'd like to, uh, you know, do an inductive Bible study. Another one said, I want to study the minor prophets. Another, I want to learn to share my faith. Another one, I want to pray for our missionaries. And it went dot, 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 all the way around. It finally came to my wife. My wife was the very last one. <laughs> and she said, I just want to be able to tell you when I haven't had a quiet time in a month. I don't like my husband. I yelled at my kids. When she said that, one of our friends, who's like the life of the party, the one who always is kind of like for the party, she said, oh, you can never say that because you're the pastor's wife. And it was like someone took a cork and went right in her mouth. We were there for 10 years. You know what? In those 10 years, you know what my wife never shared? That she hadn't had a quiet time in a month didn't like her husband and yell at her kids. You know, in fact, part of the being real and allowing others to be real with us is that it releases a great power. The power is this. The Bible says in James that if you confess your sins to one another or pray for one another, it says in order that you may be healed. You know, that's a promise. And how many, and I mentioned this yesterday, how many moms among our groups need healing? All of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> this lady with the squeaky voice earlier, she raised her hand. Um, you know, all, everybody, everybody needs healing. Well, no healing takes place if nobody prays and nobody prays, if nobody knows and nobody knows it, if we don't tell them. And so if we would just allow our moms to be real and for you to be real, I mean, have you ever been real with someone and wish you hadn't? You know, where you kind of share and then you take it back real fast. I mean, I remember one time I was in my office and uh, as a pastor and this guy came in and he said, I said, hey, Greg, how are you doing? And he goes, oh, not very good, Dodd. I said, he, he said, uh, I was just a really lousy husband today. And I said, oh, me too. I said, this morning I said this to my wife and I said it, told him what I said. 
And he looked at me, he screws up his face and he goes, really? And I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. What did you say you wanted to, you know, could, because I felt a little exposed. He, but here's how you be real. You just let them say it and you nod your head and go, I bet that is hard. You don't have to solve it. You don't have to have any answers. You just go, oh, I bet that is hard. You know, I know that sometimes, like I said, we, we homeschool in our RV sometimes and, and, uh, and homeschooling in an RV is not like homeschooling at home because you're bouncing down the road It's hard to ride, you know? And so my kids are, uh, my kids have seen everything. They've been everywhere, you know, like we went to the giant stairs and nobody here knows what that is. Uh, but you know, and they, they've been to all those civil war battlefields and president's homes. And, uh, I think it's the best homeschooling we've ever had. But I can remember one time my wife was talking with a relative uh, who's a homeschooler who gets a lot done, you know, and uh, I was driving my RV and my wife was sitting next to me and I could hear her. She was talking and I could kind of tell what they were talking about. And the, co the question came up. So how's school going? And so my wife said what I just said to you. And, and on the other end of the line was this. silence. What does it do to a mom who hears that silence? It reinforces the lies that she already believes. Oh, you're right. I am failing, aren't I? You know, what should you say instead? Sounds like you're having a great time. That's it. Sometimes even as leaders, you know, as moms who have gone through it and, you know, when you talk to a younger mom, we can be discouraging as well. You know, uh, even like uh, our in-laws, my mother-in-law or my mom, we hated when she would call during the school day because, you know, it would be like mid-morning, 1030, my, and my kids would answer it, you know, and then she'd say, how's school going today? And my kids would say, we haven't done school today. <laughs> <You know? coughs> and she'd say, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, we're just watching videos, <laughs> you know. And then they'd go, the, my mom or whatever would say, where's your mom? And she goes, we don't know where she is. <laughs> you know, uh, we saw her earlier. You know, when you finally get that mom on the line, homeschool leader, you know, or mom or grandma, what do you not say? You don't have to go, oh, is there a problem over there? You got to do it a little bit later. You know, you don't have to say any of that. We don't need the homeschool, the Gestapo's checking on each other. You know, in fact, we've taken that to encourage one another to love and good works. We've taken it to go to say, discourage one another to love and good works, you know, and it doesn't work. So when you finally get the mom on the line, you say, sounds like you're having a great day. That's all. You don't need to solve it. You don't need to solve our problems. I'll tell you, there are so many moms out there who just need someone to say, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. We'll talk about that uh, maybe tomorrow as we talk about encouragement from husbands, uh, because husbands, you need to uh, encourage. And I'll tell you again, you know, maybe uh, as, as a leader, if you're if you, be, you know, begin your meeting and maybe you do your next meeting this way, you start out with one of your horror stories. Uh, I know my mom, she has led a women's Bible study for 40 years and every year she starts it out the same and she shows a picture of her with her little kids, me and my brothers. And it was taken in Indiana, uh, where I'm from, in a place called Santa Claus Land, Indiana. Uh, I don't know if there are any other Santa Claus's uh, lands in Indiana but or in anywhere else, but we got one in ours in Indiana. And I'll tell you, he doesn't live there, but uh, they I don't know what their plan was when they named it that. Um, maybe they thought they were gonna start a big toy manufacturer. I don't know. And um, so, but when you go there, they had, when I was a kid in this early seventies, there were some cheesy, you know, little reindeer display and, and they, and then the big pinnacle thing is you could sit on Santa's lap. And so my parents decided they were going to get a picture of, of their kids sitting on Santa's lap. And so I guess I did it and I smiled and cheese and they took it. Well, when my took my little brother, he freaked out, you know, he wasn't going to do it. And he's running across the whole store, wherever. And my mom is coming unglued, you know, she's angry. And my dad is standing there and he's got an, you know, an old camera and he 
I guess he just thought this would make a good picture. <laughs> and so he takes a picture and you know, it's one of those where it just, cause it's kind of blurry. It's not very good, but it just catches her in this, st this state where her face is all contorted and she's yelling at my brother, my brother's screaming and Santa Claus in the back, just staring, you know, and my mom shows it every time to say, this is what my life was like. You know, and I think we need to do that uh, with the people that we shepherd. Um, okay, the next one, uh, it is a, either it's number five or, or the letter E. Uh, so uh, you need to be the homeschool guard, you know, the, the guard dog for your group. You know, if you're part of a group, you need to guard that group because I'll tell you, there are a lot of speakers, philosophies, books, and people uh, who are poison to your group. You know, maybe they put undue pressure on your uh, moms, or maybe it's just a philosophy that you can tell that it's weaving its way into it. Um, you need to think, grrr, you know, don't just let it go. And it might be other things as well. Uh, it might even be in your homeschool group where you have a domineering personality. And I'll tell you, this can be super awkward and it can feel weird. Uh, but you might have that one person who is kind of like leaven in the lump, uh, you know, and flavors the whole group. Uh, in fact, we had a, uh, my wife was part of a homeschool group at one time, not the group that we're in right now. And I just say that in case someone from our group somehow watches this. This is not your group. Uh, um, but, uh, and they, there would be a person there who would encourage them not to homeschool. So they, now she didn't say, why are you homeschooling? You know, she didn't say that. She would say, if some mother said, well, you know, I'm having trouble in math in high school and it's getting hard. She would say, well, you know, you can put your kid for math in the public school. And, and she put it out there like she was helping. But what often happened is those moms would start down that route and then it would just suck them in, you know, or, or maybe ju they're just discouraging or maybe they're, uh, they don't allow people in the group to be real. Uh, there will be there, you know, there's those perky homeschool moms sometimes who just, you know, they make it sound like it's so easy. Well, all you need to do is this, or if you will just do these subjects, everything will turn out good. Sometimes as a leader, you need to say some hard things and that maybe you, you know, with the counsel of other leaders decide Hey, Mary, you know, we like having you in our group, but we don't want you to say those things anymore, you know, because that's discouraging because these moms want to homeschool. They don't want you to encourage them out of homeschooling. So, you know, we'd love to have you here, but if not hit the highway or whatever. Um, but you need to guard your group. Um, if you're part of a, a leader of a homeschool group, give them lots of opportunities to share their hearts. You know, uh, my wife's favorite part of our homeschool group that she's a part of right now is not the time where uh, her kids get to go out and play in the gym, you know, because I do the gym time and, uh, you know, we'll have 40 kids. And, uh, you know, it's not like she loves that part that that her kids get some exercise time or or that they can do a little extracurricular thing or learn something. What she loves is when they break the moms break up at certain times and they'll put three or four moms together, four moms together, and they just get to share their hearts. Um, you know, but sometimes I know that uh, some groups get so busy, that's the part that gets pushed out. Uh, that they, they have their extracurricular time, they have to clean up time, they have set up time, they have, you know, a uh, craft time. Fight that, that, that urge, or maybe fight that process that that pushes those out make sure you give them those times that they maybe it's a desserts or 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 whatever uh that they have some time just to talk about how hard it is again that that time to be real um and even in leading that i, I know that my wife will say sometimes 
again, a strong personality will take the conversation into something. You know, they talk about COVID every single time. They talk about, uh, you know, mask mandates or whatever, every, or political things every single time. Or the, the Ukraine. Uh, not that those things aren't important, but your times together should be homeschool times. You know, where you talk about kids and husbands and how hard it is to be a mom to all that. Um, so you give them those times. Uh, the seventh one is uh, push them back into their homes. Uh, because, you know, it's interesting to me that, you know, this is called homeschooling. Uh, but sometimes our co-ops keep them a little too busy and we pull them out of their homes. Um, we have so many offerings and so many, uh, you know, field trips and and things that they can do, or we're planning things, and which those things are fine. I think they're great, um, but give them opportunities to be at home. So don't overburden them. Don't guilt them uh, for feeling like they can't they they can't miss. Uh, I know homeschool groups uh, that you know you got three strikes and you're out. You know because there's this light a line waiting to get in, and so they're like, if you don't come in for three times, you're you're done. Uh, and I understand some of that. I'm not telling you not to do that, but cut them some slack when they can't be there um, because life just er comes up. And it's nice to know that I can still go to my group, even if I haven't been there for a few weeks and I'm still a part of it. Um, so kind of push them back in. Um, number eight, and this is a big one, um, urge them to love their husbands. And we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, a little bit later, but urge them to love their husbands. That's from Titus chapter two, um, you know, because uh, and there are lots of ways to do that. Um, and we'll talk about those later. But I and I'll give you one as it pertains to homeschooling leaders. And that's, uh, you know, make sure that when a mom comes to you and says, well, my husband doesn't want to homeschool. I say this really uh, not flippantly. I, I, would, I would encourage a mom who was in my group, if she says her husband doesn't want to homeschool, I would encourage her, then follow your husband. Because what I see happen is I see certain mom, or I see moms who will say, you know, I believe in homeschooling. I'm going to go to homeschool, you know, and their husbands are like, this is sprung on them. They don't, they didn't think about it at all, you know, and they're saying, oh, we want to homeschool. And they're like, I don't know about that. I don't feel good about that. You know, I want my kids to be normal. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want them to have, I want them to have all the great experiences that I had. Uh, and, uh, we'll talk about that later too. But, what happens is then the mom says, well, I am going to homeschool my children because I am not putting my kids in that kind of environment. I'm not going to lose the hearts of my children. And so they dig in their heels. And you know what a husband does? He digs in his heels because he doesn't know anything about anything, but he doesn't like this different. And now she's pulling and now he's pulling. And guess what they're teaching their children? something way more important than algebra, you know, they're teaching them how not to be married or how not to live together in a right way. And so what I say to moms and what I would encourage you, you know, if a mom says, well, my husband just doesn't want to, I'd say, well, why don't you talk to him and say this, honey, I mean, if you really, really, really don't want me to homeschool, <sighs> okay, I won't homeschool. It will break my heart, you know, and I'll cry a lot. I'll try not to, but my heart will be broken. But if that's really what you want to do, we will do it. Now, I'm telling you right there, when a wife does that, her husband undigs his heels. And there, I, I can't believe there's a husband alive who wouldn't say, well, I mean, really, if it's that important to you, you know, okay, I guess we could try it. You know, and now all of a sudden something amazing happens and they're pulling the same direction and there's not that a battle going on and you're teaching your kids something really important. So I would urge you 
to urge those ladies to love their husbands. Because side note, sometimes husbands feel like they get lost in homeschooling. We feel like sometimes that you like our kids better than you like us. You like homeschooling better than you like us. Do you think that makes us feel good about homeschooling? No. Do you think it, sometimes it makes us not even feel good about our kids, you know? And so you want to, uh, again, urge them to love their husbands. You want to urge them to love their children. This is amazing to me because, you know, you would think that as homeschoolers, you all love your kids, right? <laughs> it's not always easy. Oh, it's easy when they're little tiny kids. You know, when they're tiny babies, oh, my daughter and my uh, two sons, they both have, they have three children, three brand new babies amongst themselves now. And, and I mean, it is like, they all ooh and all. Ah, and, but as they get older, it gets harder, you know, and sometimes in the midst of homeschooling, you're trying to get your schedule done and the moms, you know, you see your kids no longer as students, but as adversaries who are in getting in your way of accomplishing things and you're, you know, doing this and your kids can spend a whole day and not, never see your smile. And, you know, I, and in fact, I sometimes wonder as homeschool moms, if you'd take a quiz in the middle of the day and go, stop, we're going to take a quiz. And then you go, here's the quiz. Do you think mom likes having children? I wonder what they would say. No, kids are a pain. You know, homeschooling would be fun if it weren't for kids, you know. And how do they know that? How do our kids know that? Because we never smile at them. We never smile, period. You know, everything's all stressed out and all whatever. As homeschool leaders, just keep encouraging your moms to love their children. It might be by doing less at homeschool. It might be by saying, you know, I know that's causing a lot of stress. You don't really need it. You can even say it in whispers in the corner. They're not going to need that, you know, uh, and, and, and be okay with that. Um, <laughs> uh, and you will have done something. In fact, uh, we have, uh, we have a friend, Vicki, and Vicky's children are a lot older than ours. And, and uh, she would contact my wife maybe about three times a year. Uh, and it was usually by email. Sometimes they would see each other in person. But whenever she would email her, she would always finish her email. You know, like the goodbye part. The, what, do you, what would you call that? The signature. Right before the signature, she would say, enjoy your chicks. And what she was saying when my wife had all these little kids was enjoy them while they're young because they grow up so fast. Um, and, and I remember another mom, one time uh, we were in church, we had a kind of an informal church. It was a room about the size of the room we're in now and maybe a little smaller. And there was a mom, I was sitting towards the front. I always sit towards the front. And there was a mom who was sitting behind me who was a homeschooling mom. Lot, there were a lot of homeschoolers in the church. And, and this homeschooling mom <coughs> was a militant homeschooling mom. I mean, every time I went to her house, I felt stupid because, you know, she had, they had more whiteboards on their walls than any home I've ever been in, probably any school I've ever been in. And there were just marker boards everywhere. And they had things, they would have molecular numbers written down and all these equations. And she had three boys who were all, you know, late teens, and they were all super high academics. The, the, she was a, a science teacher at one time, and he was a science teacher presently. And they were just intense homeschoolers. And so she was sitting behind me. And so I'm sitting in front of her, which is the same thing as her sitting behind me. And uh, this mom came down, and she sat next to her. And she said, uh, and this is, you know, like five minutes before the service starts. And and she said, so I'm thinking about homeschooling. What advice would you give me? And I almost turned around and said, don't listen to her, you know, but I didn't. I thought, oh, you know, all wisdom doesn't end with me. So I'll just, so I'll listen and see if I need to undo it later. Uh, so I'm listening <coughs> to their conversation. And uh, so she says, what, what, what advice would you give me? And the mom, she pauses thoughtfully. 
And I could hear her thinking, and she sighs. She goes, well, and I was just bracing myself, you know, like, don't say anything, Todd, don't say anything. And she said, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would say this, enjoy your children. Just enjoy your children. And I'm like, that was the right answer, not just for her, but for me, you know, who may be a little more laid back, but I need to enjoy them too. So you urge those moms, not only to love their husbands, but to enjoy their children. And you do as a leader, whatever you can do to help them do that, you know, and keep reminding them that these relationships that we talked about yesterday, that they're going to miss them. You know, they're going to miss these one day. Um, as we kind of now kind of come in for a landing, uh, let me say the last one or the last two, number nine or F, uh, I don't know. Um, don't retire. You know, I know that there, some of you might be getting to a, maybe your kids are graduated or you're, I, I saw a mom at a conference. I think in Florida and she goes, Oh, this is my last year. You know, my kids are going to graduate and I'll never be back again. And I'm like, Oh, don't do that. They said, keep coming back because all these new moms need to see a mom who made it through because it feels so good when you hear somebody else's stories and how, or just to see that they, that they made it through and to, you know, um, to, uh, not just pass along your wisdom, but maybe to stay up on top of things, you know, keep getting the, keep, stay on the blog or stay on the Facebook page and, and see what they're learning. Because, you know, the thing about, I think the downfall of homeschooling could be that we forget where we've been. Um, I was just looking, uh, recently, uh, I saw that I, I had spoken at a conference with someone else and I'd never heard of them, but they were a big deal, I guess. And uh, I looked them up and I saw on their Facebook page that they were speaking at a virtual conference and there were probably 30 or 40 speakers, you know, and I've been doing this for 20 years. So I thought, you know, I wonder who's speaking there. I didn't know a single one of them, you know, and they were all young and they were all, you know, their pictures were of them in fields of daisies and things like that. Uh, and, and I thought it's a different kind of philosophy, you know, and I'm not comparing it to this necessarily, but remember when Absalom, you know, he, he gathered people of his own background. He gathered his own friends to him. And that was kind of his downfall that he, he, he didn't take advantage of all those old people who had traveled for longer. And I'm afraid, you know, maybe as a homeschool world, maybe we're starting to gather our own peers and saying, you know, the things that we want to hear. And so don't, you know, don't check out, uh, maybe babysit, uh, give those moms a break. Uh, not all moms need you to come and watch their kids forever. Uh, and I don't even think I could handle that, but you know, I can do a couple hours and you know, I can keep them busy and I'll tell you, that is a great gift that you can give a mom just to, or just invite her over uh, with her kids and say, yeah, it's okay. And, you know, when you invite them over, when they get to your house, make sure you serve them macaroni and cheese and hot dogs, uh, you know, or, or cereal or something, you know, to, so they know that you don't fix really fancy meals all the time, you know, so you don't put the pressure on them as well. Um, and then lastly, and then if we have any questions, we can take some questions. Um, lastly, um, stay married, stay married. Now, if you know, I don't, I don't know anybody here. I don't know anybody who's watching and I know some of you've been married multiple times. Some of you aren't married now. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this point right now. If you're married, stay married, you know, because again, we're seeing moms who say, you know, all my mentors, their, their families dissolved and I don't have anybody to look at anymore. And they, I need that, you know, and it's hard being married. Uh, it's really hard being married. It's super hard being married. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, and I, and really this is kind of born out of the, the, the idea that, uh, you know, about five years ago when everything, maybe six, seven years ago now, everything was kind of changing. 
they were redefining everything, things that should not be redefined. And I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know if I was supposed to like get, you know, a million people and we're supposed to march on Washington uh, or I'm supposed to, you know, hold my breath until something happens. I don't know. And I just kind of came to the conclusion, I'll just stay married. You know, I, I don't know about everybody else. I don't care about everybody else, but I'm just staying married. And so I'm going to encourage you to do the same. Um, because, you know, when you get the marriage part right, homeschooling is a bonus. And if we could pass that on to our kids, who could pass it on to their kids, uh, you know, I think we will have accomplished a great thing. So let me just say again, uh, leaders, you're doing something really, really important. Don't give up. Don't retire. Don't casually go off into the sunset. Uh, you keep at it because those moms desperately, desperately need you. Um, and again, because this, this thing goes so fast, that's kind of why I do what I do. Um, in fact, you know, at my house, uh, I like, I like things to be easy. I mean, I do, I do. I would like everything. I'd like homeschooling to be easy. I like life to be easy. In fact, I like bedtime to be easy. I'd like to think that, you know, when I put my kids to bed at night, that it could just be get them in bed and we're done. Uh, but it never feels that way. It feels more like I'm just trying to push them through as fast as I can because I want time to myself. And so when my kids were little, I was just like, come on, guys, get in bed. Let's go, go, come on, come on, let's go. I'm like, have you brushed your teeth? And like, no, I just got it wet. And I'm like, good enough, get in bed, go. You know, and then my kids, you know, when you turn off the lights, that's when they decide to tell you how much they love you. And they can't seem to stop. And uh, I don't know if it just because it feels so good or because they're stalling. I don't know why. Um, but at my house, I'm just kind of like, guys, OK, it's time to go to bed. Good night. I love you. And they'll say, I love you, too, Dad. And I'm like, I love you. And they'll say four fingers. And at my house, four fingers means I love you more. And I'll say four fingers. And they'll say, OK, Dad, love you. And I'm like, I already said that. I'm not going to keep saying it over and over again. And they're like, come on, dad. And I'm like, I love you. Okay. I know you. And okay. Good night. Four fingers. I'm like, I redid that. I'm not going to do it again. Okay. Just go to bed. And they're like, dad, come on, put your fingers up. No, I'm not going to. There I did it. Go. Okay, good. Now go to bed. Okay, dad, I love you. And I'm like, I'm not going to keep doing this. You know, just go to bed. We're good. You know? And, and so I end up, I'm yelling at my kids as I'm backing down the hallway. Stop it. You know, I'm breaking every parenting rule there is of consistency and saying what you mean. And, and finally, I can remember one time I drop into bed and I'm laying there in my bed and I can hear one of my kids running down the hallway. I'm thinking this would be a good night to die. Uh, and I hear him go into the bathroom and I hear the toilet flush and then I hear him run back. And because I, I can't see my doorway because it's like this little sweet thing going. And, uh, but it sounds like he stopped right outside my doorway. And I'm thinking, why would he just stop there? And so I listen. Four fingers, Dad. <laughs> now, here's the deal. And this is like one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. I used to tell this story, and I would say, oh, I just can imagine myself because I can. I know me. I know that one day I'll stand at the end of my hallway at night and it will be dark and it will be quiet there will be no little kids there will be no medium kids or big kids or girls in their room and i again i know me i will stand there and i will wish so badly i could hear four fingers dad but it will not be there and again i i've told this story a lot of times uh but it's happening now and of those eight children that used to fill that hallway, there's only four left. And the first four go slow. The last four go a lot faster. And it will be, I will be there soon. Uh, and that's why we do what we do. And that's leaders. That's why you encourage them to love their husbands, love their children, because it's going to be over before you know it. And so I just want to encourage you again, leaders, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a really, really good thing.